much for hosting me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to do this. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about, uh, about how I came to write the book and then uh, kind of go through uh, some of the main arguments and um, of course leave plenty of time for, for questions because I think that's always uh, a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, when I, when I arrived back in, in China in 2017, um, it was the, to work as a reporter for Bloomberg, it was the start of the Trump administration, um, you know, and it was, it was very obvious uh, fr from just being there on the ground, the, the, the incredible pr progress that China had made in terms of growing its economy, in terms of developing its military, you know, it was, it was launching this ambitious Belt and Road initiative to connect economies across Asia and beyond. It was militarizing islands in the South China Sea. And as uh, the Trump administration was, was picking fights with US partners and allies, and criticizing multilateral institutions, there also seemed to be this extraordinary um, opportunity for China to kind of step up and take on more of a leadership role than it had done in the past. Um, but, you know, the, the longer I kind of observed uh, what, what was going on, the, the, the clearer it became that, that somehow China wasn't able to, to take advantage and to kind of step into that vacuum. And I started to, to puzzle uh, over, over why that might be. Um, and if, if you step back for a second and, 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 and think about the kind of world that we're moving into, um, you know, this is, this is going to be a world where there's no single superpower that defines the way that the international system works and where the ability to persuade others of our point of view is, um, is increasingly important. Um, and, and yet China somehow doesn't quite seem to be able to, to do that. Uh, that art of persuasion is something that's, that's just not quite there. And so the more, the more that I looked into this question, the more I started to see Chinese diplomats really as a microcosm for that, that problem um, on China's part. And, you know, when I would meet them um, on, a, on a kind of personal level, they would be suave and funny and charming, and they would speak foreign languages ranging from, you know, Czech to Indonesian. And yet, uh, when they got up on the podium in the foreign ministry, or when they sat down across the table from, from American diplomats or other foreign diplomats, suddenly they became very stilted, uh, incredibly formal, quite ideological, and as the years rolled on, um, also increasingly hostile and, and sometimes even aggressive. And, uh, and so I started to think about, you know, why is that? Why is it that this, this country, which has such extraordinary economic military prowess um, somehow falls short in the diplomatic arena and when it comes to the power of, of, of persuasion. And so as I started to delve into the topic, I, um, you know, I was conducting interviews in Beijing with the Chinese diplomats and their foreign counterparts, but I also started to, to delve into the history a little bit. And uh, found this collection of uh, more than a hundred memoirs of, of former Chinese diplomats, uh, mostly written in the 1990s and 2000s. You know, a, a period in China's history which is a little bit more open um, than we see today under under Xi Jinping. And you know, while while it's a pretty boring collection of of books, they contain little details that provide kind of a, a, a glimpse of, of the personal struggles of, of, of Chinese diplomats. And by extension, um, you know, China's struggle to communicate um, with the world. And, you know, when I started out on this project to write a, a history of China's diplomatic core, it was a pretty niche and uh, pretty geeky uh, topic. But, you know, as, um, as we drew closer to the, to the present day, Chinese diplomats started acting in this, uh, this very abrasive way, you know, storming out of international meetings and shouting at foreign counterparts, getting into Twitter fights with people, um, insulting foreign leaders, spreading conspiracy theories, and you know, all of the behaviors which today have, have collectively come to be known as wolf warrior diplomacy. And so this topic kind of went from a, a pretty niche thing 
to a very, very mainstream um, concern for policymakers. Um, and if you if you watched any of the hearings in the Senate um, for for President Biden's political appointments um, earlier this year, you'll have seen this idea of wolf warrior diplomacy raised again and again by administration officials. And so you can see um, that it's really an area of of concern. But I guess my main takeaway um, from you know spending several years poring over these these kind of dusty, boring memoirs is that this, this wolf warrior phenomenon has very, very deep roots in, um, in China's political system. And actually, you can trace it all the way back to the founding of the PRC, the People's Republic of China in, in 1949. Um, and so when Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, founded the, the People's Republic, um, the country basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, it kicked out all of the, the Kuomintang nationalist diplomats who were there before because it believed that they were too ideologically impure to, um, to represent China on the global stage. Um, and its leaders faced kind of a paradoxical challenge. You know, on, on the one hand, this was a, a paranoid, secretive political regime, which, which was constantly... Um, worried about the ability of the outside world to undermine its grip on power. Um, and yet, you know, on the other hand, it, uh, it, it had this, this, this important imperative to communicate with the outside world and to, to win friends and, and build influence for itself internationally. And so, you know, faced with that, that paradoxical challenge, China's first foreign minister, uh, a man called Zhou Enlai, um, came up with this idea that Chinese diplomats would act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. Um, and what that meant was that Chinese diplomats would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. They would be disciplined to a fault, and they would display what he called a fighting spirit whenever uh, anyone challenged China's interests. And so using this kind of militaristic ethos, um, Zhou Enlai came up with a set of very distinctive behaviors for Chinese diplomats, which have, many of which have lasted right through to the present day. And so when Chinese diplomats um, speak with foreign counterparts, they will stick incredibly closely to um, very tightly defined uh, talking points, even if they know that those talking points don't resonate with foreign audiences. Uh, they will often move around in pairs to keep tabs on each other. When they're worried about not looking sufficiently tough to leaders back home, they might shout at foreign counterparts. Um, and oftentimes they'll elevate even the smallest incidents to, to major international issues because they worry that they'll be judged as disloyal to the Communist Party if they don't deliver. Um, and, and, you know, this approach led to what we would now call uh, wolf warrior displays right from the start of the PRC's history. And especially at times when there were periods of domestic political uncertainty um, back in Beijing. And so, you know, in, in 1950, this, this veteran revolutionary leader called Wu Xiuquan, who, um, you know, had, had, had fought in the, in the Chinese revolution and in the war against Japan, he had a, a, a bullet mark across his cheek. Um, you know, he, he, he led a delegation to the United Nations in New York and he delivered a speech which, you know, frankly makes today's wolf warriors look like a real bunch of wimps. Um, and, and Time magazine at, at the time described the speech as two awful hours of rasping vituperation. Um, if, if, if that gives you any idea what kind of uh, what kind of tone he was going for, you know, even more dramatically, uh, during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, Chinese diplomats uh, got into literal fights with uh, with with people in London and, and actually wielded axes um, on the streets of the city as they faced down protesters outside the the Chinese representative office. But 
But at the same time as those kind of wolf warrior displays have, have been there, there's also this other tendency in, in Chinese diplomacy, which is this, which is built on really this need to, to win friends and, and build influence. And so China's diplomatic corps was equally capable of using the great discipline that, that they, um, they worked so hard to foster and, 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 and using that to, to kind of pursue these kind of charm offensive tactics where China would expand its circle of influence and, and win friends. And so in the mid 1950s uh, at the Bandong Conference for Asian and African Nations, Joe, uh, who faced a great deal of skepticism from, from local nations at that meeting, set aside his, uh, his pre-scripted talking points because he realized that they would fall short in the room. Um, and he delivered uh, a kind of improvised speech, which, uh, which didn't harp on Marxist ideas. It didn't dwell on the status of, of Taiwan and, and China's territorial claim there. And instead, he, he set about winning trust uh, and, uh, and building understanding with people in the room. Uh, perhaps even more uh, dramatically in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre, uh, China launched an incredibly successful charm offensive, um, which, you know, lasted a couple of decades and, and culminated in Beijing hosting the 2008 Summer Olympics. And so there are kind of these two tendencies which, which cycle in and out over time. There's this, this push to charm the world and to win friends. Uh, and you know this, this tendency on the other hand to use wolf warrior tactics to kind of tell the world off. So recently we've seen a lurch back toward that style of kind of combative assertiveness, um, which we've seen a number of times over, over the People's Republic's history. And I think that, that that push has really been driven by two things. So, so on the one hand, there's a new confidence that China has about its place in the world. And on the other, there are these enduring insecurities which, which exist alongside that confidence. So the confidence, I think, really started in, in 2008-9 uh, in the aftermath of the, the global financial crisis. Um, when we saw a couple of years of really quite assertive Chinese diplomacy. Um, and, and that push became increasingly apparent after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in 2012. Um, but, you know, at the same time as, as Xi has encouraged um, a more assertive brand of Chinese diplomacy and, and greater confidence for China, uh, the Chinese political sphere has become increasingly tense. So she launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which has punished more than 1.5 million officials. Uh, he abolished presidential term limits, and he's been experimenting with the use of re-education camps in China's far western region of, of Xinjiang, and focused, uh, you know, really resolutely on on ideological conformity at home and um, fostering, in some cases, quite strong hostility to the outside world. Um, and when Chinese diplomats see these signals um, taking place in domestic politics, uh, they know how to, they, you know, there's a richness and a context there, which means that they can interpret them uh, in a very, very precise way. And, uh, you know, they, they, over, over the decades, they've experienced multiple rounds of political purges. During the Cultural Revolution, Chinese ambassadors were locked in cellars. They were forced to clean toilets. They were beaten by their subordinates until they coughed up blood um, and even sent off to re-education camps themselves. And so, you know, they know how high the stakes can be when things go awry in, in Chinese politics, and they know to constantly be on the lookout for those kinds of, of pressures. And I think what, what happened then was that, that that new confidence and those set of, of uh, enduring insecurities that were that amplified under Xi Jinping 
uh, set a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. The Chinese diplomats started to try to mimic the language that Xi Jinping was using at home about China moving closer to the center of the world stage. And they began to hand out copies of his book around the world, just as, as Chinese diplomats have once handed out copies of Chairman Mao's Little Red Book. And that new tone really went into high gear after the, uh, the coronavirus outbreak. And so China at the start of the pandemic was under attack um, for its role in covering up the origins of the virus. But it also looked around the world and you know, felt pretty vindicated about the approach that it had taken toward uh, containing the spread of the pandemic as it watched the US and Europe really struggle to, to get the outbreak under control. And I think the result was a series of outbursts, which uh, were all apparently cheered on by, by President Xi, who even issued uh, a handwritten note to China's foreign ministry, uh, which called for more fighting spirit among Chinese diplomats. And, uh, you know, there's, there's one diplomat in particular, uh, a, a man called Zhao Lijian, who has kind of become the face of this new approach to diplomacy. Um, Zhao started off as a, a relatively obscure figure in, in, posted to Islamabad in, in Pakistan. Um, and he got himself into a Twitter fight with uh, former US National Security Advisor Susan Rice, um, which, which kind of rocketed at him to domestic stardom in China um, and, and set him apart from many of his counterparts who had been slower to embrace social media and uh, would certainly never have picked a personal fight with someone of such high stature in the US. And, uh, you know, eventually Zhao was appointed uh, foreign ministry spokesman in Beijing, making him one of the most high profile faces um, of, the, of the foreign ministry, but really of, of the entire Chinese government to the rest of the world. Um, and, and, you know, Zhao's tactics in that role um, kind of escalated to such a point that during the, the last part of the Trump administration, he actually suggested that uh, the US Army had deliberately uh, started the coronavirus outbreak um, in Wuhan, which uh, of course, you know, prompted fury inside uh, President Trump's Oval Office um, and, and did serious damage to, to US-China relations. But, you know, Zhao, while he's the most high profile example of this type of diplomat, he's not the only example. So, you know, I think of someone like Gui Tongyo, uh, China's ambassador in, in Sweden, who was summoned to the Swedish foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years. Uh, and, and he said in an interview with the media when he was asked about his behavior, uh, for our friends, we have fine wine and for our enemies, we have shotguns, um, which I think gives you, <laughs> gives you some idea of his, um, his approach to persuading others. Um, not everyone, it should be said, in, in Chinese foreign policy circles likes this new approach. You know, there are people like China's former Consul General in, in San Francisco, actually, uh, a man called Yuan Nansheng, who, who have spoken out in public um, and warned about the kind of extreme nationalism that they're seeing um, from China uh, in recent years. And even Xi Jinping, um, in a speech earlier this year at the start of the summer, talked about the importance of, of China cultivating a lovable and respectable image in the world. Um, which I think was at least a modest recognition that, that some of these tactics that we've seen in recent years have, have generated a, a significant amount of, of pushback and, and caused China quite a bit of reputational damage. Um, but, you know, as, an, as anyone who has delved into the history of PRC diplomacy knows, um, large parts of the fighting spirit that we've seen um, on display in, in the last few years have actually been there right from the very beginning.